thousands of people have mysteriously vanished in America's wilderness. Join us as we dive into the deep end of the unexplainable and try to piece together what happened. You are listening to Locations Unknown. What's up, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Locations Unknown. I'm your co-host, Joe Irado, and with me, as always, is a man who won American Idol using only sign language, Mike <laughs> Vandebogard. Ah, thank you, Joe, and thank you once again to all of our amazing listeners for tu- tuning in. Uh, this is part two of our Pemberton uh, incident series. It's gonna We're going to wrap it up with a bow. Um, I think this is a really interesting story, and... Uh, we got. I got a couple theories that I'm gonna. Don't say them yet. Not gonna say them yet. You always love saying your theories like immediately. Want to talk now? But you know uh, nothing about show business. No, nothing. <laughs> Neither do I. Yeah. So say them right now. Um. So just uh, before we get into all that, just a couple uh, housekeeping items here. So, two new Patreon shoutouts. Uh, I'd like to give a thank you to Beth, uh, Frederick, and Karen. Apologize for butchering this. Uh, her. Uh, Heronimus. How do you think I did? Heronimus? There we go. Heronimus. Uh, I'm satisfied with that. Aaron, Aaron Muse. Aaron Muse. There we go. And uh, again, would like to give an episode suggestion shout out to Jen Calvin for bringing this whole incident to our attention. I had never heard of it, which is kind of crazy because a, a lot of shows have talked about it over the years. Thank you, Jen. Yeah, thank you, Jen. Also, uh, if you'd like to call the show, you can call 208-391-6913 and leave a voicemail. Joe and I are actually going to be, for our members only episode recording right after this, we're going to be going through about 27 uh, voicemails. Oh, yeah. You're, you're going to want to join Patreon up. or subscribe on YouTube or subscribe on all the other places. So if you, to, yeah, to, if you to called one. Um, anytime after July 20th of 2023 and left a voicemail, uh, we are going to play it in this upcoming episode. And we've implemented a new rule for <laughs> our Patreon that? subscribers that we'll just do this every 10 we get, so we won't spread them out so much. Yeah. Um, I listen to a few of them, but most of them I have not listened to. So That's um, good. Yeah. Going cold, that's the best. Should be fun. Um, if you want to support the show, like Joe said, you can support us on Patreon, YouTube memberships, premium subscriptions on Apple, still waiting on X to approve our membership. Uh, they still haven't already? Nope. Oh. So, I don't know what's going on over there, but... Come on, Mr. <laughs> Musk. Um, and if you, you can't, you know, support monetarily, but still like the show, just tell your friends and family. Just get annoying about it. Just talk about the show whenever you're awake. And <laughs> and if you want a signed poster by Mike <laughs> and Joe, you can uh, record you referring us to 10 of your friends and signing up for subscription. So, that's going to be the big one. There you go. Waiting for our first one. I'm, gonna, I'm waiting. These okay. are not moving until that happens. <laughs> All right. Um, outside of that, I, I don't have anything else about you. All right, everybody, let's gear up and get out to explore locations unknown. On our last episode, we learned about Marshall Iwasa who went missing on November 17th, 2019. Days later, his truck would be found burned out in a remote area north of Pemberton. Welcome to part two of the Pemberton incident, where we learn of another missing person in the same area at the same time. Join us this week as we investigate the disappearance of Daniel Riak.
So before we get into the timeline, um, we are, we're going to do a history of the First Nations people in British Columbia, which and, Daniel uh, was a part of. You just really just couldn't wait yeah, until couldn't I wait. finished talking. But like, go right enough. go right ahead, Mike. This is yeah. super important. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Ouch. Um, <laughs> if you want to learn about the location, listen to the first episode. We're not going to go through all the location stuff again. Okay. So. Just that was that was important to like jump in there and scream. Yes. <laughs> the people who always complain about us doing that yeah. are going to be like, "Finally." <laughs> nah, they'll complain about something else. Um oh, so and I just want to, Go ahead. I'm, <laughs> go ahead. I'm just joking. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> that was very good. You're a good actor. That was, I was super convinced. The best part was I wasn't even annoyed. I was like, "All right, this is important too." <laughs> We've known each other way yeah. too long. All right, so uh, here's a little history of the First Nations people in British Columbia. Uh, indigenous people have lived in the area now known as British Columbia for more than 10,000 years. They developed their own societies, cultures, territories, and laws. When European explorers and settlers first came to BC in the mid-18th century, the province was home to thousands of indigenous people. I will cut in here quickly. I don't. Did you mention that Daniel was a part of the First Nations? I did. Okay. You were busy interrupting That's me when true. I when I said it. Okay, and then you went like, ah! <laughs> uh, before the arrival of Europeans, First Nation is in what is now Canada were able to satisfy all of their material and spiritual needs through the resources of the natural world around them. For the purposes of studying traditional First Nations cultures, historians have therefore tended to. First uh, group First Nations in Canada, according to the six main geographic areas of the country as it exists today. Within each of these six areas, First Nations had very similar cultures, largely shaped by a common environment. The six groups were woodland First Nations, who lived in the dense boreal forests in the eastern part of the country, Iroquoian First Nations, who inhabited the southernmost area, a fertile land suitable for planting corn, beans, and squash. Plains First Nations, who lived on the grasslands of the prairies. Plateau First Nations, whose geography ranged from semi-desert conditions in the south to high mountains and dense forests in the north. Pacific Coast First Nations, who had access to the abundant salmon and shellfish and the gigantic red cedar for building huge houses. And you forgot the last one. I'm I, I'm taking a breath. You all are right. really just rushing this along, aren't you? You got all you know, riled up with... Uh, and the First Nations of the Mackenzie and Yukon River basins, whose harsh environments consisted of dark forests, barren lands, and swampy terrain known as muskeg. So here are some interesting facts about Canada that we didn't talk about last time. Uh, Canada is a monarchy. Canada has a queen slash king. It's the same as the UK's Queen Elizabeth II now, King Charles III. That's because Canada is a member of the British Commonwealth, having formerly been a colony of the British Empire. As a constitutional monarch, His Majesty King Charles III doesn't rule the country. However, as Canada's head of state, he remains a fundamental part of Canada's system of government and, our, and its sense of identity. I almost said our. Yeah. <laughs> They're going to come get me. Yep. Canada is the second largest country in the world. Canada has the longest coastline in the world. And now we're going to tell you about the Beaver War. Despite the name, it was a pretty brutal conflict and is considered one of the most bloody in North American history. Basically, in the 17th century, the Iroquois wanted to dominate the fur trade in the region and enlisted the help of England. Rival nations sought the help of France. The result, bloodshed that ended in a stalemate. There's a lot of famous Canadians living in the U.S. Seth Rogen, Mike Myers, Justin Bieber, uh, Michael Bublé, Alanis Morissette, Keanu Reeves, Jim Carrey, Celine Dion, Neil Young, and Drake. And I do want to say um, they all came here. Yeah. What, is, what does that say about Canada? Oh, I'm just saying. Well, they, oh. can, they can have Ooh. Justin Bieber back. And we just lost all of our Canadian supporters. <laughs> The coldest temperature ever recorded was in Snag Yukon at negative 81.4 degrees Fahrenheit. Chilly. Very cold. Can't <laughs> complain about ours anymore. So, Mike, how about you talk about Daniel React? Yeah, so we'll jump right into character profile here. Uh, we don't have a ton of information on him, but we do know that he was born March 16th of 1990. He was last seen on November 25th of 2019, uh, but strangely enough, he wasn't reported missing until January 7th of 2020. And he was last seen 
uh, on the rear deck of a residence on the 6500 block of Squamish Valley Road. Um, basically, he walked off a deck and threw a trail uh, in the backyard. His remains have not been found. He was a male, and he was a member of the First Nations. Uh, he's 29. He's 5'9", 150 pounds. He had brown hair, brown eyes. Uh, Joe now is showing some pictures of uh, Daniel on the, the screen if you're watching this on YouTube. Uh, clothing. You and know, gear. I always mean to tell you that. If they're watching on YouTube, they can already see it. That's true. So I mean, you, you can just keep talking. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for pointing that out. <laughs> <laughs> What's funny is I realized it like last week. Yeah. And that was the one time the video stopped working. Yeah. Who was running that? <laughs> <laughs> Me. Uh, so clothing and gear he was last seen in. Uh, black shoes with white trim around the soles. Right shoelace was black, left shoelace was white, uh, black baggy pants, blue black tan plaid button up long sleeve shirt, and dark color suspenders. And, you know, this this guy had a rough upbringing. We'll get into it in a minute here, kind of what happened in his childhood. But he, uh, throughout his adult life, struggled with drug abuse or drug use. And That's too bad. Um, you know, he worked, from what I could tell, he was in construction and... Uh, yeah, just an all around. Everyone liked him. He's, they said he was a good guy, even though he had you know troubles and everything like that. So, um, but as you'll see, I th- I really think that the drug use really factored into what happened here. Okay. Um. So, outside of that, we will kind of jump right into timeline. So before we get into the actual timeline, I want to get into a little bit of the history of Daniel. So. Like I said, he had a tough life growing up. His mother was a drug addict living on uh, East Hastings, which I believe is Vancouver. And she actually was in a documentary filmed by the Vancouver Police Department in 1999 called Through a Blue Lens on the heroin epidemic in the city. And it was a documentary really talking about how like police got to know these people and kind of started feeling bad for them and the plight that they were going through. Um, And at the same time, there was a string of strange disappearances and murders of women in the city. And it um, and she, sadly, was eventually murdered at the age of 25 and dumped in an alley. Oh, jeez. And her murder was part of an unpublished scandal called The Missing Women of Downtown Vancouver. Uh, that was a commission that was uh, ordered by the lieutenant governor of British Columbia to evaluate the police response after this string of murders happened. So, you know, Daniel had the deal with... Were, were they all, like, drug-related? I'm guessing she's, like, in a documentary for I think, drug trade and I all mean, that I stuff. think they were related in the sense that uh, women were targeted that were kind of, t- you know, had issues going on that okay. were vulnerable. Um, so, yeah, it included women with, you know, drug issues and addictions. Um, so Daniel, you know, grew up with a mother that was addicted to drugs and I believe um, it was heroin for her. And um, so after she was murdered, he was raised by his uncle's family who really did care about him in Edmonton before he moved back to the, his reservation in Squamish. And he had two kids with his girlfriend, but uh, everything I read was he the drug issue was a real big problem in his adult life. And it led to a lot of run-ins with the local police. Um, so like I said, just a, a well-meaning guy, but just, you know, that's what a terrible, he grew up in just a terrible situation. Like just trying to make the best of it and just, just too much. But like I said, his, his family and friends still really liked him and said he was a cool guy. And, uh, he really cared about his kids and everything. So, uh, sad, situation before you even get to what happened to him. So um, I have a little bit of a pre-disappearance timeline. So, yeah, bring us back to part one kind of stuff. Well, not even that yet. I'll get into that before theories. This okay. is just Daniel at this point. So, But keep the dates and times in mind when I'm talking about Marshall from our first episode because things are kind of – you'll see why – I'll try and cross-reference while you're talking. And I tried to do that in the notes, so okay. I'll, I'll bring it up when I can. But So we were starting off on November 25th of 2019 at 10 a.m. So Daniel was picked up by the local PD uh, and taken into custody that morning. 
Uh, and this was on a ranch north of Squamish near his reservation. Uh, according to reports I saw, the ranch owner claimed that he was very intoxicated and that's why he called police and they, they picked him up. So um, later that day, so it's November 25th, 2019, it's 5 p.m. now, the police released, released him up from their custody on Finch Drive. So now we have kind of a string of surveillance photos of him. So, And that's the day that um, hikers were scored, uh, reported the discovery. No, so this is On interesting. November 25th. The hikers found... Oh, that was after. Hikers found the truck on the 23rd. Yes. Police were up there on the 25th. Yes, that's what I mixed yeah. it up. Yeah. Yeah. So and the, very interesting theory on all this. So I'm excited. I'm really excited to get to theories. So um, I couldn't tell by how you wanted to talk about it at the beginning yeah, of the episode. No. Uh, so now it's uh, 6 p.m. on the 25th. So Dan w- was seen on surveillance video at a Tim Hortons on Progress Way. So Tim Hortons, I believe, are convenience store grocery stores in Canada. Yep. Um, he was then seen at a Walmart same day on, uh, at six forty five in That's Squamish. a really uh, popular, popular uh, store in America. Yes. <laughs> um, he was seen at another Tim Hortons on progress way at seven Oh seven PM. And then <clears throat> he was going to a lot of Tim Hortons. He, uh, he received a ride from a friend at Tim Hortons, uh, in the Chuckamus area. <clears throat> so. It's commonly nicknamed Tim's or Timmy's. Tim or Tim's. It's a multinational coffee house and restaurant chain based in Canada. I thought it was more like a convenience store. It's not. It's a coffee house and a restaurant chain. Okay. All right. So <laughs> I was wrong. Uh, it's now. It's a convenient place to get coffee and restaurant go. food. Uh, it's now the. Tw- it's still the 25th. It's 11.30 p.m. Uh, Daniel's vehicle was believed to have been seen parked at Lewis Drive and Squamish Valley Road. On November 26th of 2019, at 1 a.m., this would be the last confirmed sighting of Daniel, and this was confirmed in a press release from the uh, police, local police. So Daniel was seen on the rear deck of a residence uh, in the 6500 block of Squamish Valley Road. This would be his aunt's house, and he walked off the deck through a trail that led to Lewis Drive. Um his aunt tr- described him as acting strange before just walking off. Uh, it's now the next day, November 26th of 2019, two twenty PM. This was the same day that Marshall was actually reported missing. So Daniel's vehicle was reported as a, uh, abandoned, uh, to the Squamish police. The police had then located and seized his vehicle. It was a black 2004 Honda civic with BC license plate, JL 933R at 2.20 p.m. Um, as somebody had reported it is abandoned in the area. It was also reported that the car was found idling with his cell phone inside, still inside. Mm. So, um, I have little, theories already. A little strange. I'm not going to talk about it, though. <clears throat> okay. All right, now we're jumping ahead to January 7th of 2020. It is now 4.15 p.m., uh, Squamish PD received a report at 4.15 p.m. on January 7th that a family member who had checked in on Dan found that he was unreachable and that he had not been seen since before Christmas. Uh, according to the police, they were told this is out of character for Dan not to be in touch by phone on birthdays or holidays. Uh, after police conducted several checks, officers were unable to locate him <clears throat> and he was classified as a missing person. Police and Squamish Search and Rescue conducted searches in the Squamish Valley and Paradise Valley areas that day. So <clears throat> from that day on into February, a lot of search and rescue missions were, were looking for him. On, we got a, a report on February 11th of 2020. Uh, Squamish police say officers continue to search daily for Daniel Members from the Sea and Sky um, RCMP General Investigation Section, Squamish SAR, and the Integrated First Nations Unit were on the waters of Howe Sound, shoreline, shoreline of Squamish Estuary, and Chequemus River on February 11th. They were quoted as saying, we will continue to do varying tasks per a missing persons investigational file and work with Squamish Police, Squamish Search and Rescue on land and water. Squamish RCMP Sergeant Spokesman 
Sasha Banks told the chief. So that's really the end of the timeline. They don't know much about what happened to him. Um, they conducted, you know, several thorough searches in the area. Nothing was found. Um, and at the time, I don't think they were connecting the dots between Marshall and Daniel. Yeah, it was just something that was or also if, happening. Or if they were, they were keeping it really quiet because of bigger reasons, which I'll get into in theories. So, okay. Um, first, before I even get into theories, I want to get into some common details of the case supported by family and witness statements that I found. <clears throat> so these are these aren't necessarily facts that were released in a police report, but through subs- subsequent research, um, these are statements that I found based on family members of both Marshall and Daniel. So we know that Marshall lived rented an apartment in Calgary. He was in Lethbridge visiting his mom and went to his storage unit. So uh, Lethbridge is a two-hour and 23-minute drive southeast from Calgary, and the storage unit was about 10 minutes from his mom's house. Lethbridge is a 14-hour drive uh, west. So if you're in Lethbridge, you got to drive 14 hours west to get to Squamish. If you're in Lethbridge, it's a 12-hour and 33-minute drive to Pemberton. And the location where Marshall's burned-out truck was found is about 31 miles north of Pember- Pemberton. Mm-hmm. Okay. So we also know of two individuals that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call them. So unknown individual one, and I'll go by UI number one, and unknown individual two, UI number two, Though I do know their names. Um, okay, you're holding it for now? I'm not going to mention their names because they haven't been officially charged with anything. Okay. No, that's smart. Yeah. So I'm in a lot of, there is a lot of people online. So this case has gotten a lot of people like becoming armchair, like PIs. And there's a lot of people throwing around accusations that certain people are yeah we don't need to feel that fire yeah we're not even going to get into that we're just going to keep these as unknown individuals so and now this can get kind of tricky to follow along so just try to try to follow along with the relationships between these people so ui number one this a person this person is allegedly friends with daniel like they're they're actual friends they're not just acquaintances or anything okay um this so ui number one is a friend of UI number two, but Daniel is not a friend of UI number two. He's just an acquaintance. Okay. Um, uh, unknown individual number one was known to do drugs with both Dan and unknown individual number two. Um, unknown individual number one it is has a documented criminal history, including robbing storage units and violent assaults with a deadly weapon. And based on statements from family and witnesses in the local area of uh, the Squamish area, UI number one was out of town for multiple days around the time Marshall would have visited his storage unit. So now a little bit about unknown individual number two. Like I said, they were friends with UI one. Um, Allegedly, this unknown individual two hit Daniel with a hammer in 2018 in an assault. And again, this unknown individual too has a documented criminal history, including uh, storage unit robberies and violent assaults. So um, these two individuals are ne'er do wells. Yeah. They're drug users, uh, very, you know, documented criminal history, violent. Um, So, you know, definitely I would say suspects, so Daniel now, he lives in the Squamish area, area, approximately one hour and 13 minutes south of Pemberton. Uh, items found at the burned out truck, including passport IDs and phones, belong to Marshall, according to his family. Um, and multiple items found at the burned out truck were also confirmed by the family to be things that Marshall had in his storage unit. Now, this is where it gets a little interesting. According to Daniel's family, the cooler found at the burned out truck was not Marshall's, but Daniel's and had the name of unknown individual two written on it. 
Um, like I said, it's reported that both those unknown people were known to have done drugs together with Daniel. Also, two trash bla- two trash bags of clothes found at the burned out truck were also confirmed by Daniel's family to be his clothes that he normally kept in his car. So it's getting strange now. We've got a cooler of Daniel's that was found at the burned out truck scene along with two garbage bags of his clothing. And Joe now has on the screen um, one of the other images. You can see the clothing, the bags of clothes. Uh, Yeah, right there. You can see two with the red drawstrings, one in the background. So those were Daniel's clothes. Interesting. And then there's another picture that you can see a red cooler yeah, in the background. Oh, yeah, it's up in the grass. So that's Daniel's cooler, and it had unknown individual, unknown individual two's name written on it. Enhance. <laughs> Enhance. Rotate. Yeah. <laughs> like in the movies, right? Yeah. They do things. Well, that like, was Super Troopers, when he just keeps enhance. Not physically enhance. possible. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so. Okay. Um, so so this, had, this had the unknown, because we're not naming them. Unknown like, individual the, two's name on it. Was, it. He was friends with Daniel two, supposedly? Yeah. Or was that just the first one? Uh, no, so unknown individual one was friends with Dan, but in unknown one was friends with unknown two. Dan was an acquaintance of unknown two, but not friends with Okay, him. all right, so that was his cooler there. But it was in Daniel's possession, was, confirmed yeah. by his family. Okay, so like he could just still have it from them hanging out yeah. some other time? Yeah. Yeah, I've got like, I actually have a cooler that's my buddy's, so yeah, I get that. So... Before even getting into theories and stuff, kind of strange, right? A guy that lives almost 15 hours away, his truck's found in a remote area, burned out with this other guy's stuff all around. Yeah. <laughs> a little odd, right? Who's also missing. <laughs> Who's also missing around the same time. Around the same time. Yeah. Okay. Kind of well, weird. Yeah. Kind of. It's me. <laughs> so, if I were a betting man. If I were a betting man. So we're still going into kind of some facts. Now I'm going to get kind of into the little bit of the timeline summary of what happened to Marshall. So, and this is still based on report reported exchanges with Marshall and Daniel's family. So, like I said in episode number one, uh, on no, November 17th, 2019 to November 18th of 2019, from 11.30 p.m. to 6 a.m., Marshall was trying to gain access to a storage, storage unit in Lethbridge, to allegedly get PC parts before heading back to his apartment in Calgary. Um, Now on November 23rd of 2019, Marshall's burned out truck was found in that remote area, 31 miles North of Pemberton. Um, And this would be roughly 20, 122 miles North of Squamish. And that was when the hikers found it. The police didn't get up there till the 25th. Wait, I, I, can I go back a little bit? Yeah. So you both the unknown individuals had rap sheets that said that they robbed storage containers. Is that what you said? And violent assaults. Violent assaults. Weapon. So, oh, uh, uh, oh, theories. Oh, oh. theories. Well, I was going to ask a question, but I guess that would give away, huh? Yeah, I mean, we'll get to Do you to know that. where I'm going? I think I do. Okay. All right, all right, I'll, all right, I'll stop. That's theory number one. Theory number two, I think, is the theory I believe. Okay. Now, so. I, I wanted to... I wanted to I was pulling a memory from the first one. I wanted to confirm yeah. if he was doing... Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, All right. Keep going. Uh, so like I said, hikers found Marshall's burned out truck on the 23rd. On the 25th, RCMP reach the site and take additional photos of the scene. And based on comparisons of photos taken on 1123 versus 1125, items at the scene were disturbed by someone. They, they don't know who. But things were changed and moved. Uh, so very interesting. So now, on November 25th, 2019, at 10 a.m., like I mentioned earlier, Daniel was picked up by RCMP for an undisclosed reason, possibly was drunk, on a ranch north of Squamish and south of the burned-out truck. So kind of right in the middle, you know, probably at the 15-mile marker between the two spots. Okay. And um, the police, as far as I could research, never disclosed what he was picked up for. But there's a lot of speculation that he was picked up that morning as a person of interest in the burned out truck because they were up there investigating the truck. And then for some reason, Daniel was, you know, within, you know, 10, 15 miles of the via of the location, no car. He was not dressed for the weather or the conditions. So, uh, very strange. 
So it's now November 26th of 2019, and this is when it gets a little weird. So Daniel storms out of his, his aunt's house and walks away. It's believed that Daniel was high on an unknown drug. Uh, during the conversation with his aunt, he remembers, he mentions he got into a fight with a friend down at the river, which we find out later is unknown individual number two. And it's also noted that he was staying with unknown individual two, who is a mutual friend of unknown individual number one. Now, this part is not confirmed, but the aunt was told that unknown individual number one had moved Daniel's car at some point. So um, we have unconfirmed reports that unknown person number one had access to Daniel's car. The ability to move it, so he had the keys. So Okay. Now we're getting into theories. Here is theory. Now these theories um, are, I did, a t- I did a lot of, snooping around on the web and I've kind of these aren't necessarily I didn't come up with everything in these theories these are kind of a I I read a lot of stuff of what people from the local area were thinking and kind of tried to formulate two different theories that would make the most sense based on the facts I just talked about the stuff I just talked about is more concrete okay the, now these two theories I'm going to talk about are purely theories. There's there's nothing official that I can point to to say that this theory. All right, so these this, are hun- these are gut guts and hunches. There's guts nothing officially that says it is based on the stuff we already talked about. Okay, so all right, disclaimer heard. Disclaimer heard. Please proceed. Please. Pr- okay, so theory number one: Marshall was the unfortunate victim of a crime. So in the first theory, Marshall is innocent and he's just in the wrong place at the wrong time. So with the criminal history of the two unknown individuals, uh, perhaps they randomly encountered Marshall at his storage unit and attempted to rob him. Something went sideways. They murdered him. And then on his, on their way back to Squamish, they dumped his body during that time. So that, so he, it was when he left his mom's, he went to the storage unit, yeah. correct? Okay. Which that's... maybe explains why maybe he was under duress when he was trying to enter the key cut. The, that's why it took him so long to get in to the storage unit. We don't oh, know. like they were forcing him to yeah. go. Okay. And what we learned from the first episode is the storage unit closed until the morning. So they couldn't get into it until like 6 a.m. That's what I read. So you couldn't just access it 24 hours a day. You had to wait till hours of operation. To get in. Which would make sense of when we're like, why would someone stay overnight to get yeah. in a storage unit? No, if you think about it, he lived in Calgary, which is a couple hours away. It's late at night. He may have not. Oh, just been to... like, hey, I'm going to sleep in the car. Yeah, I don't want to okay. go back, wake my mom up. So, I mean, I can kind of see it, but. I would do something like that. You're not going to drive back to Calgary and then drive another two and a half hours back in the morning. That would be yeah. a waste of time. Um, so then after, you know, robbing him, they drive um, oh, and they used, because these two unknown individuals know Daniel and have access to his car, they drove Daniel's car to the storage unit. They were going to commit the crimes in a different car, not linked to them. So they're in Daniel's car. So you think this, like, in this first theory, you're thinking it was, like, uh, what's it, premeditated? I think like they... planned it out? I think they're like, we're going to drive somewhere far enough away that's not where we live. We're going to rob storage units. We're going to take Daniel's car so... We're not in our own vehicles if something happens. And so do you think Daniel is with them? No. I don't think Daniel is with them. And I'll get into why. Okay. So they... Had, you're, so, you're lo- you are losing me. All right. Well, stick all right, with so, me here. Okay. So they, they go to the storage unit. Something goes sideways. They end up murdering Marshall. They now have Daniel's car and Marshall's truck. So they drive back to... The Pemberton area. This would explain why Daniel's or Marshall's credit cards were never used again because he wasn't driving because they would need gas. So either they paid in cash. Also to explain why at the time when they were going around looking for surveillance video of Marshall, they didn't find anything because he wasn't driving. Okay. So, that, that does answer that. Um, so okay. so I, I'm, I'm back on board with you now. So, yeah. so it, you know, and these people, maybe they knew of this remote area and they, they thought it was a good place to burn out a truck. So for an unknown reason, um, 
they leave some of Daniel's like items at the crime scene from the car. This theory doesn't really explain why they would chuck a bunch of stuff out at the crime scene of Daniel's unless they were trying to implicate him in the crime to okay. keep themselves clean. So, you know, and if these guys are high on drugs, they might not be thinking coherently. So they're I think when you your one of your careers is robbing storage units, you're not that bright to so begin with. They're probably thinking like, crap, we just murdered someone. We gotta destroy the truck. We can't be caught for this. Let's just toss Dan like they probably have no like let's just toss Dan's stuff around the truck site. When the police come here, they'll think he did it. You know, mm-hmm. he's a drug user. No one will believe him, like yada yada yada. You know, that maybe is a reason why they would have uh, done that. So, so unknown one and two come back. Like I said, Daniel was staying with unknown two at the time. When Daniel finds out about his stuff being left at the scene, he rushes up to the scene to try to destroy evidence. And on his way out of the truck site, he's picked up by police because that would make the timeline kind of fits in with that. Um, if Dan, so if Marshall was at the storage unit, 14 and a half hours away, theoretically he would, if they murdered him, cause it would have been morning on the 18th, 14, 15 hour drive. That means earliest they're going to get to Pemberton would be late on the 18th, maybe early on the 19th. Now they, it, you know, like we said, it takes a while to get up to that spot where the truck was found. So if it's the 19th, takes them a bit of time to get up there. They burn the truck out. That's enough time for, the, you know, maybe they get back down to Squamish on the 24th. Daniel finds out about this, and he goes up there to try to destroy evidence, comes out. He, he's picked up by police. Upon returning to Squamish, uh, he gets into an argument with these unknown individuals. And if we're going under the assumption that they're willing to murder some a random person at a storage unit, once they find out that he was at the crime scene and then he was picked up by police, uh, they end up murdering Daniel and disposing of his body to keep him quiet. Okay. That's theory number one. Okay. Um, Theory number two was another theory that was floated a lot by people that Marshall actually sells and traffics large quantities of drugs. And part of this was, so he worked in construction, um, but some of the statements I found said that he had recently just paid off his truck entirely. And um, people people weren't buying that he went to a storage unit and, you know, frantically tried to get in a bunch of times over PC parts. So this second theory, again, just a theory. There's no official reports, but so Marshall is at the storage unit, not to get PC parts, but to pick up drugs. He planned to traffic West to the Pemberton Squamish area. This would explain why nothing seemed to be missing from the storage unit. If it had been uh, if it had been robbed, it would have been turned upside down with items getting removed. In this scenario, it's likely that no foul play happened to Marshall until he got to the location where his burned out truck was, which was the location that they were making. the. And this wasn't just like a small time drug deal. This was like a major quantity. And these two unknown individuals maybe are higher up in whatever organization okay. that this is happening. So like I said... He, he planned to, he wanted to get up there much earlier. He wanted to leave the night of the 17th, but he couldn't get in that storage unit until the morning of the 18th. So this would make, make him arrive in the Pemberton area late on the 18th or early on the 19th. Um, so now he's late for his, his sale. And for an unknown reason, he gets to the, lo- the remote location to make the transaction and he's killed by the buyer. Now we don't know like killed and then they took everything and didn't pay for it type deal. Well, yeah. So like he gets to the look, we don't know what happened. Maybe they get in an argument about him showing up late and the buyer murders him. 
He disposes of the body, takes the steering column out of the truck and torches the truck. Um, and before torching the truck, obviously they probably, all the stuff ended up on the ground because they probably were, you know, tearing the truck apart to make sure they got everything out of it. Okay. Including whatever drugs he might've been trafficking. Um, and the, this kind of assumes that the buyer or buyers, uh, unknown one and two, they obviously, we know that they know Daniel and probably have a significant influence over Daniel because, um, they were known to sell Daniel drugs and he did drugs with them. Um, so in this scenario, Daniel obviously knows unknown individual one and two, um, but he's not directly involved with the disappearance of Marshall. I believe that one of the unknown individuals used Daniel's car to meet Marshall for the transaction in the remote location, North of Pemberton. Like I said, when things spiraled out of control and Marshall's killed, um, they removed possessions from Daniel's car to make room for what Marshall was transporting with his truck, which is why they had to, you know, they took out, you know, maybe he had garbage bags of clothing in his trunk. Like, well, get rid of that. We got to, you know, put the drugs in the trunk. So this would explain why Daniel's stuff was thrown out around the truck. They had to make room in his car to take the stuff back. Um, so then these two unknown individuals get back um, to the, you know, the Squamish area. And this is now when Daniel has the fight with his friend. Uh, likely, so in this scenario, they're not trying to, you know, frame Daniel for the, the burned out truck. But they literally, they still left his stuff there because they needed the space in the car to bring drugs back. Okay. Daniel finds out about this, gets into a fight with them, soon after rushes up to the crime scene to tamper with the evidence, and is on his way out is picked up by police. And not long after that, the unknown individuals find out that Daniel not only been to the crime scene, but also was questioned by police and likely murdered him if they're so, willing to murder Marshall. Do you think, like, there might have been more stuff there? And he took it? No, I, if based on the pictures. With, so that's because some of the stuff was moved and not take. Like yeah. the cooler was as a big thing to just move. Well, if, if it has a dude's name on the it, the thing is too. Or though, is it because it didn't have his name on it? He's the, like, I'll leave this here. The thing is too, based on what the aunt said, it, he was high at the time, so he's not thinking clearly either. Okay. So uh, he went up to the the scene. A lot. We don't know. This is a theory. Yep. He went up there to. Do God knows what tamper with stuff, you know. Try and cover up. Try and cover his, it up in a, in a, a link. A link to him in a bad state of mind. Sure. Um, okay. And then on his way out, it's picked up by police. Okay. This would also explain maybe why police were keeping are keeping this quiet. Maybe they're trying to uncover a larger drug network or operation going on in the area. Okay. And don't want to draw attention to this to spook any of the people involved. So. Okay. And then finally. This is the last I we have an eyewitness sighting of both Daniel and Marshall around the time when Marshall went missing. So this is a quote from the gentleman who saw them in a bar at the time. So he wrote, it was me that seen Marshall in Squamish at the Irish place, the bar that has now closed uh, since April 2020. Daniel Riak also went missing at the same time, and he was at the bar sitting with Marshall and the other dude. I described what I could to police, uh, what the dude looked like, but it was just a basic details like brown hair and eyes. He was about six foot one with average build. The dude was a scare was a bit scary to me because I picked up a bad vibe. As soon as their eyes met, I subsequently avoided eye contact with him. I somewhat knew Daniel since we are both from Squamish, and he joined me outside for a cigarette. Marshall and the dude went and sat in Marshall's truck in the parking lot. I asked Daniel what them two were doing sitting in the truck. Because they were out there for about an hour. He didn't know, but said, I think that dude is going to kill us. It really seemed kind of like an outlandish comment and never really believed him. All three of them eventually uh, left eventually, Daniel in his own car and Marshall and the other dude in Marshall's truck. Uh, Marshall was the pass in the passenger seat. All right, so they're connected. So, like, by eyewitness. 
Yeah, so this guy saw them in, in a bar. In potential illicit activity. And this guy reported it to the police. So police are aware of yeah. this sighting. That is not, I mean, this is a small area. that I, That's like the coincidence, the uh, odds of it being a coincidence are so super low. That's why I don't think theory one of it just being a random I get what you're. I get what you're getting at with that, yeah. Well, I, to, yeah, to be, I didn't have a theory at first. I just remembered yeah. that they had the storage unit, but I get what you're saying now. Yeah, I mean, that theory does make a little sense. If they sure. have a history of Robin storage units, you would probably pick a city farther away. Mm-hmm. Um, Unless, now, again, just to reiterate what you've said several times, none of this is proven. This is almost like our Hollywood theory. Yeah, like this we're, is, we're making it up based on what's there. But to me, this is like, if they're that, if they know each other, yeah, and they're involved in, again, in theory, in the drug trade, and let's say that he... He, he uses his storage unit for that. They would know about that. Yeah. Potentially. So maybe it's a mix about, of both hold, theories. Hold on. Hold on. Yeah. Okay. What if they know that he has a storage unit and then he keeps it there and they have never been able to find out where it is. So they'd like follow him one time. Okay. Like that's where it's like, cause he's not going to tell people where it's at. Yeah. So he may be like, I'm going to go visit my mom. So they don't think so. And then that's when he goes and visits. He like doesn't drive directly from his house in case he's followed. Again, this is a Hollywood theory. From what I read too is that drive between Lethbridge and like Squamish Pemberton is, it's a long, grueling drive. Well, if you're involved in drug trade and large quantities, you, that would be smart to, yeah, to look, not be like, oh, I'm going to go back and forth to where I keep all that's this stuff. Why I, that's why I'm leaning more on theory too, just because yeah. it make like he was going that distance to meet them out there. And I, I would location. say I've, again, this is a theory, but I don't think it's very outlandish to say that this is definitely connected and drug related. Absolutely. I think I, uh, that one I'd, I'd stake a lot on just because the backgrounds granted it's smaller areas, yeah, Be, and so like more people would know each other, but these are huge distances, and a lot of coincidences and overlapping dates. Yeah, and we like I said before, I got into theories. I was listing off things that are more concrete, like these unknown individuals are actual people that Daniel was either acquaintances or friends with that did drugs. They sold him drugs, and that this was known. I, I, to me, that's not even the big part. The big part is the connection to Marshall. Yeah. Like, yeah, I believe that just because that's, there's a long history. And there. now if Daniel's stuff wasn't found at the site, I would say it's just a really weird coincidence. I would still, it would be less convincing, but I still yeah. think again, small area, not a ton of people, yeah. very remote. What are the odds? Super low. The fact that there's mixed stuff there and they have this connection and they all have, you know, not so great backgrounds potentially and like especially drug use small town like now marshall didn't have marshall's background was um you know he was going to college um you know on this on the face of it he was different from daniel in the sense that i don't think he had a drug he had it together more yeah he was going to college he was writing a video game like he was coding a video game um he a very different person but that doesn't mean he wasn't trafficking sure. drugs to fund, you know, maybe the coding project or the, you know, college. I mean, I don't want to, and that's why I didn't want to name any of the people that people, the names, you go search this, you'll figure out the names pretty quickly. Um, I yeah, don't want it. I get what you're saying. Yeah. And I feel bad with theory two stating that Marshall could be trafficking large quantities of drugs, but this was a theory that kept coming up and up again. Well, it's not like you're saying for sure it is. You're just throwing stuff out there. I'm just which... throwing a theory out. What else would explain? So, like, we know Daniel has a history of drug abuse, and he's buying drugs from these two unknown individuals who have a very violent criminal history, mm-hmm. long, violent criminal history. And all of a sudden, Marshall's truck ends up 15 hours away in a remote location with Daniel's stuff scattered around it. I mean... We could go uh, a theory. We could go more of a theory, maybe less Hollywood of like the drug interaction more. If he was hanging out with them in a truck and people are making comments like, dude, I think he's going to kill. Like maybe they just didn't like him and they're yeah. bad dudes and they 
kid like abducted him and drove both cars out or said like, Hey, let's go do this. And then drove two cars out to a spot, killed him out there, burned the truck out and then left. Well, and remember Daniel's car was impounded by police. So that car was back in town. So th- after it was discovered his car, let me go back, find the timeline. Um, Daniel's car was impounded, I believe on, uh, let's see. Oh, like they couldn't have happened around when, well, no, Well, I mean, in reality, they wouldn't have to have Daniel's, Daniel's car. They car could have any other car was seized by police on November 26th. So that was, yeah. After, so after, yeah. After. So after they could have drove both cars up there for some reason, they all went together. And well, something happened, and they killed Marshall. That's why I said if it was a drug trade. I'm they, not even saying drug trade. What if they're just like, what if I, they're they're idiots who are violent? What if they just decide they want to kill the dude, and they're like, we need to go do it up here. Yeah. And like, like some, who said when they got out of the car, it felt like the dude was going to kill me? That was, um, that was Daniel telling this guy that provided the eyewitness of them at the bar. Let me go back and read. That who was going to kill him? The, the scary dude that was with Marshall in the truck. Which okay. we don't know if that's the unknown individuals, yeah. but I think you could probably, it's safe to say. Well, <coughs> I think yeah, but he would have said, because he it was an acquaintance of him. So if he just said it was a scary dude, that would tell me it wasn't one of UI1 or UI2. And we don't know. We, we don't, don't know. know who that I'm, guy, I'm saying, yeah, I'm just saying. But. Wow, this is complex. Yeah, it's complex and. Um, this eyewitness sighting at the bar makes it even stranger, but I think it even lends more credence to Marshall knew these two unknown individuals, maybe not like friends, but they were, they were connected in around the same time. business associates. Yeah. I mean, it had to have been, yeah, I mean, yeah, it's, it's strange. Okay. Um, so before, so we, yeah, really my, my third theory is just the second theory minus a drug thing. Just yeah, okay. yeah, just like, like not that like I'm saying like because saying he was some major drug kingpin is more of a Hollywood theory. I'm not saying Marshall is. I'm just saying I know. Marshall is like a yeah. But why would he be involved there? And I'm saying if we're gonna like the, the the Hollywood one to me is they knew Marshall stored drugs in a unit somewhere. Oh yeah, yeah. and that's where they like wanted to get him. They finally followed him and got him out there, and like I don't know, then dumped his dumped out in the one spot. That was one, or it was just they got in a fight and they knew that was a remote spot, so they drove his truck and their car out there, threw a bunch of stuff out to implicate Daniel, and then burned his truck. Although, what ma- what made me think more towards the drug trade thing is the steering column. Yeah, that seems like something drug gangs like would know about. Professionals would do. Yeah, like yeah. It, exactly, like if per, per, professional in quote, but like, and this is professional coming professional criminal. This is coming from like. Granted, it's TV, but it's always stories about, you know, yeah. real drug cartels. Like, I just watched Grisilda on Netflix. Like, they figure out, a, like, good ways to cover up how to kill people. Yeah. So, if you know that stuff, we would assume that you've, this isn't your first time. Yep. Um, That's where it's like, okay, this could be involved in some sort of drug gang, drug cartel thing. But the thing that leads me to think it was a drug deal instead of, like they got in an argument and drove him up there was when they were seen at the bar, they weren't injured. And the one guy that, you know, Daniel was smoking a cigarette with the guy who saw them at the bar. And the other guy was in the truck with Marshall. Like if, if they were hit, had already had an issue and like they were en route to the spot to be murdered. Wouldn't you think like Daniel would like run off or like tell this guy, but like, Hey, this guy's going to kill us. Cause we're, yeah, maybe, uh, maybe they were, you know, they stopped at the bar and then they were heading up yeah. to do the transaction, which I don't know. They sat in the car for the while. They could have been like checking out the product. Maybe they were <laughs> waiting for the other unknown individual. That could be too. Yeah. Um, and I'm very convinced it's all connected. It's all connected somehow. I, I we're all we're speculating on it. Yeah, that is speculation, but my I would, I would, the, I would put a lot of money on them, them being connected. My guess is the police know way more than they've publicly announced because there's something bigger going and on. They and rejected your FOIA I, request. No, I never can't. Canada doesn't have FOIA. Oh yeah, that was the episode before. Yeah. Never mind. Yeah. I just remember I you got a FOIA rejection. Yeah, but no, I, it, that would make sense if if there's a larger thing going on in that area and the police are trying to crack that. 
yeah. it would make sense if they were trying to keep this quiet to not spook anyone out of the area. Yeah. Um, okay. So that is incredible. Yeah, and I'm not even done here. So there. Before we finish here, I just want to mention there are several other disappearances in the area around this time. Um, so the first disappearances were Ryan Preventure, 38, and Richard Skur, 37. They were last seen July 17th of 2019, and they were found dead one month later. Ryan, 38, Richard, 37, uh, were last seen alive July 17th, 2019 in Metro Vancouver. Uh, Ryan's white 2019 Jeep Cherokee was found on July 21st, parked in a wooded area near Logan Lake. The lake is between uh, Kamloops and Merritt. One month later, their bodies were found in a rural area north of Spences Bridge, which is about three hours east of Pemberton. The RCMP has said there was criminal behavior associated with the case, but no further details or cause of death have been made public. So then... Um, earlier that year, uh, Ben Tyner, 32, was last seen J- January 26th of 2019. Now, this one I, is just maybe a disappearance. Uh, Tyner, was wor- a working cowboy, disappeared from the Merritt area after riding into the hills to look for cattle. His abandoned horse was found fully saddled on a Forest Service road northwest of the city two days later. Police said Ben was last seen at 2 p.m., but it's unknown when he rode into the backcountry or when, where he was headed. This is about four hours east of Pemberton. Uh, search and rescue teams scoured the area, including crews from Nicola Valley, uh, Kamloops, a um, bunch of locations. Uh, police said nearly 40 search and rescue members on site, along with dog uh, services, snowmobiles, and air support. Um, never was, no trace of him was found. And then finally... Ryan uh, Shuka, 20, was last seen February 17th of 2018. Um, he was last seen in the Spence, Spence's Bridges, Bridge area on October uh, 9th of 2017 uh, and his burnt, burned out white 2003 Ford E250 van was found on the Sac and Forest Service Road 12 miles from his home the following day. Was so, the steering column missing? That, that I don't know. Um, the, uh, a cadaver dog search of the area in June, 2018 turned up nothing. Um, police say they consider the disappearance suspicious, uh, no leads, no suspects, no news. Um, it's all in the police hands, uh, according to family. So some suspicious, I mean, the one guy that just sounds like he disappeared, but the others are suspicious murders or two bodies were found and then a burned out van in the same general area, you know, a couple hours away. Jeez. Um, but the case of Daniel and Marshall is very, that's, and it's all connected. I, I know it's, it it's to gotta be. be, it's gotta be connected. I just, I just posted a picture online. I was like, I can't wait to hear all your theories on this one. I'm like so excited <laughs> for everyone to like, to, to give us what they think, and whether I, you agree with us, like just post it online because just like when we're, this puzzled, one's wild when somebody disappears and we don't understand how it could happen. This the connection between these two, I mean, I it's got to be drug related, but it's just so strange. Yeah. Um, and it's years later now, and there's been no, no updates from police on it, as far as I could tell. That's that's wild. Um, yeah, it's a wild, a wild connection. And at first, they, they did not connect the dots between these two disappearances. At first or still? Because, it, I mean, there was nothing in the reports I saw in the first one that No, like, there was there's even been a, a lot of, like, media attention now on the Pemberton incident. But, like, it wasn't news or anybody like that that came up with this connection. At first, it was a true crime podcast. Like, there you go. So, <laughs> um, but, yeah, I and I think based on what I read about the families, they just want to get as much information they want this out there as much as they can to get it solved because if yeah. this truly is a murder these two unknown individuals are still loose yeah out there yeah they haven't been caught yeah and they're a part of something bigger potentially and i feel bad because a lot of people are throwing around a lot of accusations and if you go online there's a lot of people being like blamed as suspects that are probably innocent so yeah like the mob pitchforks and everything yeah the, yeah just, the, the mob is kind of out trying to solve this and they're being pretty reckless with um you know just throwing names out there yeah without anyone being charged or even questioned 
So. I mean, you think people had had something better to do than just sit around and talk about Some cases and cases. stuff all day. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> so, I don't know. Yeah, let us know what you think. This is this is kind of a little out of our wheelhouse of... Not really. I mean, it's in it's, the wheelhouse. It's, it's like it's in the wheelhouse entirely. I guess. All right. It's in our wheelhouse. <laughs> I take that back. We'll cut it. We'll cut it. Cut it. Nope. Leaving it in. <laughs> we always leave it in. <laughs> we always... I was just telling somebody that today. They're asking about doing podcasts and yeah. like, what's the editing like? I'm like, we stopped. Yeah, I like mean, what happens joke. if you screw it up? Like we say we cut it, and I then we end say up leaving. We'll it. Cut it and we yeah, never cut it. <laughs> we never do. <laughs> it's a joke. It's from "It's Always Sunny." Absolutely. <laughs> well, thanks again for tuning into our show. We appreciate all of you for listening and sharing locations unknown with your friends and family. Be sure to like and follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube. And I was just on LinkedIn. And I realized we still have a page there. I'm gonna start posting there again. Yeah, try and get all those professionals. LinkedIn. Um, and you can follow us and get our videos on YouTube. This one, it looks like it's still recording. So I hopefully, Hallelujah. yeah, last time it only recorded the first three minutes and stopped. Um, also if you'd like to support the show monetarily, please visit our website or Facebook store to buy some sweet, sweet swag. And you can also subscribe to our patron account, our YouTube account, uh, Apple subscriptions, hopefully X subscription Sue. Come on, Musk, musky man. Yeah. And there you'll have access to special events, additional shows like the one we're about to do where we listen to your hilarious phone calls uh, and voicemails. And those are only accessible to paid customers. Every now and then we'll release one of the public to show you what you're missing. And lastly, when enjoying the beauty of nature, whether backpacking, camping, or simply taking a walk, always remember to leave no trace. Thanks, and we will see you all next time.